Kerouac possesses this unique ability to transform the dull into the extraordinary. Better than food, man. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, as ever, Cliff Sargent. No longer in Florida, now in Detroit. Great to see you. How's it going? Probably wondering what the hell that house was. That was Jack Kerouac's last house in St. Petersburg, Florida. I actually found out that it was five minutes away from me. It was basically in the same neighborhood. And he died down the street at uh, the hospital where I would go and uh, go for appointments. So I figured that out and it inspired me to read On the Road because I'd never read it before. And I was about to go on the road. We spent several days getting up here to Michigan. I thought I might be a little too old for it the ripe old age of 29, but thankfully not. Uh, I was surprised how much I loved it um, almost immediately. You know, I did a brilliant stupid thing once and I hopped on a train uh, because I was walking with this guy. We come to this railroad crossing and this train comes by, you know, we have to wait for it to pass before we can continue. And I'm sort of tired of talking with this guy. And so it's going slow enough that I realized I could jump on it and it's heading in the direction of my house. And so, you know, my house is just a few blocks that way. So I get impatient and I say, you know what, I think I'm going to take this. And I go up and I hopped on this train and I think I was on, uh, I might have been on a flatbed, uh, you know, climbed up the steps and got on the, and stood on this flatbed for, uh, for maybe three or four blocks. And uh, or maybe even less than that, I don't know. But uh, this guy just looks at me, and he's just watching me go and I'm just like, bon voyage, Tony. I, stood on it and looked up at the stars and the cityscape and it was probably extremely dangerous and stupid but it was uh, it was terrific so then i got off and i didn't fall and i was proud of that i'm not saying you should hop a train or that you should do stupid shit like that but i did it the stars were beautiful and it was fun it was an event where i wasn't thinking i was just living in the moment and it might have been really stupid it might have been you know could have ended up really badly but it was incredibly exciting. I was just living. I was just experiencing. I was just using what I had around me or, or I was just discovering what was around me, what was actually exciting about where I was in that place and time. And that's what this book is about. And it's about doing stupid, dangerous shit like that. Much more dangerous, stupid shit. Uh, it's about getting as much as you can out of the present moment. And all of this happens for the narrator of the book, Sal Paradise, on the road, traveling across America, eventually to Mexico, but mostly America. So this is Jack Kerouac's second novel. He wrote it in the space of three weeks. Uh, it took seven years or something like that to get published. It caused this huge sensation when it came out. It was a big, big deal. Everybody wanted to meet this guy. They wanted to know who he was. They wanted to be his friend. They wanted to sleep with him often. You know, because it's all about his real life and the people he actually knew. The personality of him and the book is magnetic. You want to spend time with this man. You want to spend time with this author. And I think Michel Welbeck, the, uh, the modern French author, is he said something like that. And I probably said that before. I probably talked about this again, but I love that. I'm, paraf I'm paraphrasing, but I love that idea so much. When you want to read an author, it means you want to spend time with them. Uh, or it means you love spending time with them or something like that. And it's really true. Kerouac possesses this unique ability to transform the dull into the extraordinary. I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. I expected, you know, my defenses were up, you know. Oh, the beats, oh, the, you know, the, all these drugs and Bukowskian type Americana shit, you know. It's like I've read it, I've done it, I'm good, I got it, I was there, I was excited about it, I was into it, and now I'm done, you know. Because I read, Hen I reread Henry Miller not too long ago, reread Tropic of Cancer, or tried to, and uh, it just completely fell flat on its face. I'll try reading it again, maybe it'll, maybe I'll review it one day, but it really just it irked the fuck out of me, to be honest, it was just boring. But this was completely different. Uh, Kerouac is a great writer. And I knew a guy like Dean, I think most of us have, Dean Moriarty, who is the friend of Sal in this book, the younger, wilder, crazy guy who's just constantly getting everybody and himself, especially himself, into trouble, uh, whether it's with, uh, you know, 
drugs or women or the police he steals cars all the time he's like addicted to stealing cars <laughs> the the guy he's like is like this archetype of this guy who you know it's a horrible idea to hang out with him but he's just so interesting and so much fun the bad kid i had a few of those growing up and uh, one of them's dead now so the main character sal paradise relates their tales of travel in the late 40s across america and back and then across and then back and back and forth to see each other and do all these things and go every which way you possibly can, every corner of America, um, even Detroit at one point. New York to Los Angeles, Denver, San Francisco and back, Texas, New Orleans, and uh, at the end of it, Mexico. The end is terrific. It's just all these, you know, constant descriptions of getting on the road, constant descriptions of all these diners and bars, roadhouses, and these characters who they meet. And, you know, he remembers this person lives in this city and this person lives in that town. They stop and they pick up hitchhikers and bums and so on, and there's girls and drugs and all, you know, it just doesn't stop, it's just an onslaught. They're broke and then they're not and then something comes through and then they're down and out again and then they get arrested and this happens, you know, it's like just constant, it's just a barrage. It's, uh, <laughs> it's great. But the story focuses around their relationship, around Sal and Dean. Dean is so in love with life, he's constantly in danger of losing it. He's, constant, he's constantly pushing it as far as he possibly can. He just gets high off of it. He's like this buzzing, weird, like uh, ball of energy who, like, that has no, no focus or control over itself. His enthusiasm for life is so strong, it's dangerous. He frequently goes into these states of ecstasy where he loses himself and pushes everything as far as it can go, no matter, at the sacrifice of everything, at the sacrifice of the woman he's seeing, of his kids, of his friends, everybody, you know, he just pisses everybody off. He's just compelled, it's so strange. It's just this will to, this will of excess energy, I don't know. But we've all known somebody like that. It's all like, we've all known the person who just has to push as far as they possibly can no matter what the repercussions, even if it means losing everything. Because they're searching for something, and they, they are searching for something, both of them. They don't know what, but they don't fit in with the American middle class. They don't really seem to fit in anywhere. They just seem to be fascinated by other cultures, everything other, you know, jazz and foreign countries and bums or vagabonds and everything that is taboo or off limits. And it's a pretty radical thing to write about this in the 50s. And Dean, as it turns out, is also searching for his father who is also an alcoholic bum. So again, it's based off of real life, Kerouac's real life and the people he knew. Certain characters are based on real people whom you know, like uh, Allen Ginsberg and William S. Burroughs and this influential beat character named Neil Cassidy. That's who Dean, the troublemaker in the book, is based off of. Neil was a friend of Kerouac's and a major figure in this scene, whom I'd never heard of, and died very young at 42. They both died young, but uh, Dean, or Neil, died young at 42 in Mexico. Dean wrote Kerouac letters, sometimes really long letters, and these letters had this strange stream of consciousness style, unedited, unaffected, unfiltered, all passion and feverish zeal. Kerouac wrote on the road in that style. He borrowed that and developed this whole new way of writing, which is uh, exciting, you know? It's full of energy and speed and intensity. I mean, right from the get-go, the book starts off at 120 miles per hour. Listen to this. I first met Dean not long after my wife and I split up. I had just gotten over a serious illness that I won't bother to talk about except that it had something to do with the miserably weary split up and my feeling that everything was dead. That's how it starts. And it just goes. It just goes like a jazz song. Like a jazz song. It just like starts and it riffs and then somebody else comes in, they have a new idea, and they go in that direction and they go in that direction and it kind of like dies down for a little bit and then it comes back and then it goes and 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 it goes as far as it possibly can and then everybody's sweating and passing out. And that actually happens in the book. It's incredible, the descriptions of the jazz concerts they go to. Th that, those are my favorite moments in the book when he's talking about, because he, Kerouac's a huge fan of jazz, so you have like Dexter Gordon and he's mentioning Charlie Parker and uh, <laughs> he's, you know, the masters and uh, they go to these jazz clubs in San Francisco and 
God, just the descriptions of, of these guys playing is just incredible. I mean, Kerouac really nails it with those descriptions. Those are the best parts of the book for me, more than anything else. The trip to Mexico near the end is dope, but the jazz concerts, that's worth reading for it in and of itself. Never read anything that described a show so well. And the rest of the book is filled in with these descriptions of characters and parties and landscapes, all these beautiful descriptions of nature. God, he was describing this one part of California that was just um, terrific. The sun goes down long and red. All the magic names of the valley unrolled, Manteca, Madera, all the rest. Soon it got dusk, a grapey dusk, a purple dusk over tangerine groves and long melon fields. The sun, the color of pressed grapes, slashed with burgundy red. The fields, the color of love and Spanish mysteries. I stuck my head out of the window and took deep breaths of the fragrant air. It was the most beautiful of all moments. It's great. I would have loved to see California back in the late 40s and 50s. I think that would have been, if I could go back in time in the 20th century, that would have been one of my main things to see because I think it, I think it was probably beautiful. But he was describing Los Angeles and he's describing the loneliness of that place already. You know, that's interesting to me because Los Angeles is one of the darkest places I've ever lived while being one of the physically like brightest places I've ever lived. You know, the lighting's beautiful, everything's lit up. Everybody's out to be seen, but that city is, the history of that city and it, what it is now is lonely and dark and pretty fucking bleak, you know? He describes as everybody sort of having this camaraderie in New York through the winters and everything, but Los Angeles has a special thing. I still love it. I still love LA and I love New York, but it's weird. You gotta try it, right? Everybody's gotta try their hand because you never know. So yeah, descriptions of the landscape, the thoughts and desires and dreams of this character, everything is magnified. It's, it's always uh, the best there ever was or the worst there ever was, right? It romanticizes the vagabond traveling life, having no money and not knowing where you'll eat or sleep. It's this frenetic love letter to America and its diverse geography. Various characters frequently enter this delirious realm of infatuation with everything. And when they're pulled out, when, they're, when he's forced to work or do, and mostly when he's forced to work to get jobs, you know, he's pulled back into the, the, the mundane reality of normal life, confronted with the burden of normality. But that's essentially what the book's about. All future sacrificed for the moment, living in the moment. Roadhouse bars, house parties, jazz clubs, a whorehouse in Mexico, all of these adventures, all of these places where, you know, you get drunk and you don't think about what's gonna to happen tomorrow. And you sort of listen to these characters talk, particularly Dean, you just listen to this guy talk, I mean, in your head, you read, and he just sounds, you know he's full of shit. And to some degree, I think the book is full of shit, in the sense that if you were, if you thought this was actually the truth, that everything was this exciting, you know, no, <laughs> I don't think that's actually the case, and I think it's dangerous to, to sort of hold this lifestyle up to that level. Because uh, it's just a myth, you know, and we can see that from the how Kerouac and Neil ended their lives, you know. I mean, Kerouac had a hernia in Florida and his belly button was popping out and it was like a disgusting mess and died there at 47. And Neil took drugs and, and died somewhere in Mexico at 42. So you can romanticize this lifestyle all you want. But I mean, we know where it ends up, right? I mean, we've seen the, the, the story of the 20th century successful alcoholic author, just we've seen this thing played so much as such a cliche, you know? We know where that ends up. We know where that path leads. I mean, people still go on it and they still think it's like the greatest thing ever when they're young, but you know, they all find out. But there's a truth of the excitement of the essence of life, of the, the thing that's worth chasing after in that myth, the thing that is worth living for. So the book is also true. It's both. It's bullshit and it's not. It's bullshit and it's the gospel, right? It does seem like one big drunken exaggeration or lie, but maybe that's the beautiful thing. Because there's some sort of truth in the delirious excitement of that lie, it makes a big something out of nothing. But maybe that's why it's so special. Again, he has this real reverence for jazz music, which I, I definitely appreciate. I, I think he's a master at this. Okay. Dean and I went to see Shearing at Birdland in the midst 
of the long, mad weekend. The place was deserted. We were the first customers, 10 o'clock. Shearing came out, blind, led by the hand to his keyboard. He was a distinguished-looking Englishman with a stiff white collar, slightly beefy blonde, with a delicate English summer's night air about him that came out in the first rippling sweet number he played as the bass player leaned him reverently and thrummed the beat. The drummer, Denzel Best, sat motionless except for his wrists snapping the brushes, and Shearing began to rock. A smile broke over his ecstatic face. He began to rock in the piano seat, back and forth, slowly at first, then the beat went up, and he began rocking fast. His left foot jumped up with every beat. His neck began to rock crookedly. He brought his face down to the keys. He pushed his hair back. His combed hair dissolved. He began to sweat. The music picked up. The bass player hunched over and socked it in, faster and faster. It seemed faster and faster, that's all. Shearing began to play his chords. They rolled out of the piano in great rich showers. You'd think the man wouldn't have time to line them up. They rolled and rolled like the sea. Folks yelled for him to go. Dean was sweating. The sweat poured down his collar. Dean's always sweating. There he is. That's him. Old God. Old God Shearing. Yes. 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 And Shearing was conscious of the madmen behind him. He could hear every one of Dean's gasps and imprecations. He could sense it, though he couldn't see. That's right, Dean said. Yes. Shearing smiled. He rocked. Shearing rose from the piano, dripping with sweat. These were his great 1949 days before he became cool and commercial. When he was gone, Dean pointed to the empty piano seat. God's empty chair, he said. I thought that was great. It's fun. It's just fun, right? You know? It's about <laughs> whatever, that, whatever that word means these days, you know? I don't know. It's about fun. Days before social media, when you had to go and make your own party. When you had to do dangerous shit that might kill you in order to, uh, to have a life worth living. I don't know, man. Maybe it's a glass half empty thing, but after reading it, you're frequently convinced, for reasons maybe more emotional than rational, that the glass is not only half full, but that it's never gonna run out. So yeah, Kerouac died in the hospital uh, where I would go for my doctor's appointments, right down the street. And then he lived in a house about five minutes away from me. He had a football scholarship to Columbia College and met Ginsburg and Burroughs. And apparently he gave them the titles to their most famous books, Howl by Ginsburg and Naked Lunch by Burroughs. He created the idea of the beat generation. This was from an article in, uh, I think it was the New York Times. The word beat, Mr. Kerouac once said, was first used by a friend to signify the feelings of despair and nearness to an apocalypse that impelled them to reach out for new experiences. The novelist later coined the phrase beat generation, sometimes explaining that he took beat to mean beatific. Um, later on, he kind of got burnt out on the whole beat generation thing. I mean, you create a monster, right? But, uh, but yeah, this, was, so this novel was kind of the impetus for the whole spirit of that generation. So who should read it? Anybody who hasn't read it because they thought it was too much of a cliche. Especially if you like Bukowski or any of the stuff from that era that you've never read on the road, I think you ought to give this one a shot. It's worth your time. And anybody who wants to know about or kind of get a feeling for counterculture in the 50s. Also anybody who loves jazz. If you love jazz, read this book. Just automatically. Turns out me reading this at 29 was just right because if I was maybe 19 or 20, 20, maybe up till 25, I probably would have been more susceptible to trying some really, really dangerous shit, you know, because uh, it's exciting. It's a, it's a totally seductive book, you know. He really gets into the whole feeling of, uh, of uh, just uh, saying fuck it, but mm, I don't know. I'm a little too old for that now. Regardless, it's better than food. Check it out. All right, time for the coffee lottery. For those of you who are new, thank you for watching. The coffee lottery is where I take all of the names of patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video, uh, and I put them into this mason jar, and I draw out a name, and wh whoever's name I draw gets sent a copy, a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, and uh, some coffee roasted by myself. So if you would like to get in on that, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video. Not only will you get entered into the book and coffee lottery, you'll also get access to patron only reviews of short stories and all sorts of stuff. Check that out if you'd be so kind. Really appreciate it. Okay, that's enough. Thanks to all the new patrons this month. Really appreciate all the help. Harith, Harith. On the road, it's coming to you, Harith. Thank you so much for donating to the show. I really appreciate it. it. Makes this whole thing possible. And thanks to all the patrons. Thank you to all the patrons. I mean, no matter what you're donating, of course. Um, you're making this all possible. This is my dream job. I, I don't say that lightly. You know, this is 
phenomenally inspiring. Um, I think especially in the age of social media, it's important to have community. And this book really emphasizes that you need flesh and blood friends. And while this isn't quite, you know, I mean, I'm just talking into a camera and we're doing this whole thing and all that jazz. You, with, with such niche interests, you know, people bond pretty heavily over it. And I've discovered that doing better than food. And that's really important. And I have a lot of new friends because, because of it. Um, but I just want to say thank you. Because I think that's probably one of the biggest struggles that young people are going to have to face. People my age or younger, you know, new brave new world. It's just uh, loneliness. Digital loneliness. You know? So make sure you get FaceTime and you get into a little bit of trouble. Not too much, but a little, at least a little bit of trouble with real people. You know? Flesh and blood. Make some mistakes. Don't kill yourself and don't kill other people. But that's something I got out of the book. You know, the importance of living real life. Living real life, away from screens, stuff to think about. Anyways, if you'd hit me up on Facebook and give me a like, I'd really appreciate that. Um, Twitter, Instagram, please follow me on Instagram. I post pictures of all this stuff and uh, what I'm doing, and I really appreciate you watching. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoy this book. Um, thank you very much. Please subscribe if you have not already. Hope you're all doing well. It's great to see you as usual. Take care. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.